Hi everyone, this is the uh, workshop for module eight for Justice Ends and Means. And the focus of this workshop is to lead into uh, your assignment, your major assignment, uh, to look at an example assignment and to walk you through some of the ideas and steps involved. And part B, uh, we're going to have a bit of a quick discussion of um, the importance of communities and teams. All right. So you should be should have the actual assignment by now. Um, so this is going to be an example of, um, rather than talking about the actual assignment, um, which obviously I'm not going to be able to do, but to talk about something that is similar and to look at the process involved. Okay, so the first thing to note about problem solving assignments is there's no absolute correct answer. This is not a case of, I've cooked up something that has an actual answer and I've created a puzzle and you have to solve the puzzle and figure out what the right answer is. Uh, it's deliberately what we call a wicked problem, which is a problem that doesn't have a clear answer that requires us to use problem solving and quite often use interdisciplinary, dis, interdisciplinary knowledge when coming to solve it. So it often means that in the discipline that we're in, be it criminology, law, psychology or whatever, um, we don't have a complete answer, a complete solution that we often have to, to look further. Um, now, in terms of um, this problem, we've we, uh, so far the first um, seven or so um, weeks of the unit have provided you with a set of different tools. Each week you can think of a different tool set to solving justice-related problems. And obviously you could go through all seven of them and this in your problem and you'd come up with a different outcome in each case. Now there might be some themes in those. You might find that there are similarities and several of those approaches will come to the same sort of solution. Um, but some of them you'll find will have a different sort of solution because they're based on different premises and different ideas. Now this is um, a fairly typical assignment of this kind and my, the first important piece of advice is to narrow down your analysis and to just pick two different tools, two different weeks and use those to examine and analyse the problem uh, because you don't have enough words to go through all seven and it doesn't really, it's, it's, there's, you're going to dilute the impact of what you do if you attempt to cover every single contingency that, that, that occurs. So, so look through all seven, have a think about how each of those seven approaches would apply, but then pick two and have your focus of the assignment being, you know, here is an examination of the problem using two different methods. And at the end of the day, I can compare and contrast. That last part's really important because this is where you go beyond the descriptive and into the analytical, which is where all the marks are. You know, you only get a pass basically for being able, and even then you may not, for being able to describe what's going on. Where the marks are for an academic assignment are in your analysis, your ability to think and to back that thinking up with evidence. So... You could look at a problem and you could say, I'm going to look at um, justice's storytelling. I'm going to look at justice's rulemaking and I'm going to run through each of those, look at which what the outcomes are for each. And then I'm going to look at, look at the two of them and say, I, in this case, I think that justice's rules is the superior way of approaching it for the following reasons. So that's a classic and, you know, well-established structure for this sort of assignment. And I think... You know, unless you've got a brilliant idea otherwise, this is the way I would approach it. I would say, I'm picking, I'm selecting two, appro two approaches. Here's one, here's two. Part A, here's one. Part B, here's two. Part C, compare and make an evaluation of which is the one that you think is the best way to solve that problem. And as I said, assignment of this kind pretty short in the scheme of things. You might find that the first hundred words are very painful to write, but then you'll find you'll look down and you're at 3,000 words or something, and then you suddenly realise that um, you probably needed to be more structured um, in your initial approach. 
All right. Um, now, uh, the next point I'm making the notes is a mind map is very useful in um, creating the structure for assignments, looking at the different ideas and writing it out on paper in a visual way. Um, I do a bit of reviewing of journal articles for, for journals, and you'd be surprised how many people submit journal articles uh, that are, they get to a point and you've got no idea why they're saying what they're saying or where it's going. Um, and I'm continually telling people who are submitting these articles, so like, go back to your basics, look at your structure, make sure that you can, that underlying there's a strong and simple structure. And the classic is the compare, contrast and evaluate. It's, it's Hegelian dialectics, if you want to know the technical term for it. Um, but it's a classic for a reason. And yeah, it's it's quite surprising how often you'll get, uh, and you've probably had these to read from published articles that haven't you know, followed the advice where you'll be reading like page seven or eight of an article and you're thinking, where is this going? What, how does this fit in with everything else? And that's because of lack of that solid structure. And honestly, when you're a student and you're submitting work for assessment, you want to make it as easy as possible for the reader slash marker to follow what you're doing. Because in many subjects, they might be marking a hundred papers you might be in paper number 43 of the day and you just you just want to make it easy for them to go, yeah, okay, these are the structure, these are the ideas, here's the evidence that backs it up, tick, 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 rather than um, make it difficult for them. Why would you do that? Um, the other point here, when I've, I've spoken about evidence all the way through, think about what we've spoken about, evidence and, and sources earlier on. Now, this is a problem-solving assignment, so technically you could pass without any references. However, you probably don't want to do that because you want to do better than that. Um, so th we go back to that fundamental question of why do we use references? Um, bad answer is because we're told we have to. I don't find that to be a really useful answer in terms of making a decision of when to reference and when to not. The better answer is we use references when we want to show off what we have done. We want to demonstrate our background. We want to say, look, I've read this thing and I understand it and I can apply it to this situation. And particularly when we're looking at going from past to credit, um, but especially when we're looking at going up to, to, to credit, to distinction or high distinction, this is the stuff that separates assignments from each other. If you, if you read an assignment and, it, and there's a you know, hundred references in there, big deal. You stuck a hundred references in there. Doesn't mean anything. But for every reference that you have used, you've applied, you've demonstrated, you know what goes on in that article, and you can apply it to the situation. That's another bunch of marks that go your way. So it's the same here. And you'll find there'll be various references that you can draw on. There's stuff from your weekly readings that you can apply. There's stuff that you might find from your own independent reading. There might be things in the weekly readings that you can go, oh, that looks interesting. That looks like it applies to the assignment. I'll follow up on that. There's things you can um, just find for your own um, purposes uh, through exploration in, uh, uh, in, in journal articles. Or it's also good to bring in things from other units, you know, some of you are, are studying psychology subjects. You might find there's stuff that where there's a psychology perspective on a particular conflict that is an interesting contrast or it complements a, ju a justice perspective. By all means, go for it. Put it, put it in there. Because what we're interested when it comes to those higher grades is that is that extra work and is that extra level of thinking about things. The other thing you can use... Um, and you usually don't have to be careful with using grey literature, um, is things from blogs, things from newspapers, online, whatever. Um, obviously, that's not peer-reviewed, so it doesn't have the same status as truth. However problematic that is as an academic publication, it hasn't been peer-reviewed by other academics. However, sometimes that doesn't matter. Sometimes you've got a really interesting piece that someone's written about a similar situation. And as long as you use it, acknowledging that it's not an academic source, then, then that's fine. Um, so for instance, if 
a lot of this work involves conflicts and a lot of the best stuff online about conflicts um, and, and, you know, understanding people um, appears in these sort of semi-professional blogs. I mean, this is not like this is what Cheryl on Facebook thinks sort of stuff. When we're talking about grey literature, it is more about someone who is a professional, but they're just not publishing in journals. They can't be bothered. They don't have the incentive to publish in journals, but they might be someone who's a practitioner who just, you know, writes a blog about things. There might be someone who's a community activist who writes about things that happen and conflicts that happen in, in communities. So again, don't be afraid of, of that grey literature, but make sure the way you use it is not the same way in which you use academic literature. You can use academic literature in, in a way that's kind of truth, like it's it's conditional truth, where you say, well, a, a study was done and this was found as, a, as the study, and you might find other studies that suggest something different or whatever. But ultimately that has that, higher status of knowledge and you can say 75 percent of people think this or do this because this study was done something that's published in uh in the gray literature you can't be so quantitative in your um in, in what you argue and you can't be saying well this is true that what well, because just because someone who published it the blog said 75 percent of people it's not really good enough but the ideas are things you can draw on now in terms of the actual scenario to work through um this scenario has got a couple of important features but one of them is delegation of power and if you cast your mind back a couple of weeks when we look at um justice's process there's a lot of material in there around delegation of power so immediately one of the perspectives or points of view and here is government power it's very clearly the government's passed this ordinance around this festival it's passed power onto this committee and the committee has got done all these sort of contentious things with the power they've been given and the week where we looked at justice's process we looked at administrative law and we looked at you know that the importance of doing justice in following the procedures in dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And sometimes it's not a matter of arguing about this being right or wrong, but just saying, well, they haven't got the power to do this. They're not authorised to do this. So um, one major stream of analysis that's that's quite useful um, is though looking at what the, the authorisation from the council and going through each step by step looking at the um you know it's supposed to be an indigenous a festival that celebrates indigenous communities and they've got non-indigenous people selling ripped off indigenous art is that breaching the, the is that breaching the word or the spirit of that delegation of power um you know they've subdelegated power um to this sort of private police force in there are they authorized to do that is there anything in the original document um there is a section that says they can make rules and regulations that are necessary, but does that authorise them to create like a private police force? So, so that's one perspective you could take on this um, is to look at very precisely, specifically uh, this, the way this use of power, why this power has been delegated and the way it's then been used and whether that's consistent. Um, another, sorry, someone's just calling me. Um Another potential use of power, uh, another potential approach is to look at justice in terms of rule of law, to look in terms of the rules and to say, is this something that's fair? Is this something that abides by the the, the those initial ideas we, we talked about in terms of rule of law, in terms of um actions being made under authorised legal action rather than the whim of an individual person. Um, that might end up with a very similar result to the process approach because they're both kind of, they have a lot of similarities. And that might not end up being a particularly satisfying outcome for you because you get into the assignment and the assignment is, well, I looked at these two things and they're kind of similar. So... What you probably want to do is pick something that has quite a different outcome. And that would be 
one that I'd recommend is the justice's story, the justice's narrative approach. Because what this community festival is really this, um, you know, what was the Founders Day Festival um, that has been transformed into this True Walla Festival is telling a story about the community. It's telling a story that's moving from this colonial sort of story to this story that's about inclusion and it's about respect for Indigenous people. So at the end of that, each of these decisions are going to look at, well, what does that mean in terms of the big story that's being told? Particularly, we're looking at the exclusion of the Chinese Cultural Centre because this paranoid ravings from the, from this committee member. Um, that's telling a very bad story about what community means. It's saying community is for everyone, but not for the Chinese members of the community. So uh, whereas these are a good contrast, because whereas the procedural approach is very much pernickety and looking at the words and looking at what's happened. Um, at the other alternative, the justice's story approach is big picture. And it's looking at what the impact this has on the society and saying so it doesn't really matter what the nitpicking part of the rules are. If at the end of the day, you're telling this discordant story that doesn't fit in with what our community thinks or means, you know, having these private policing people with their no no loud conversations and no loud dancing, no no dancing rules um, is, again, saying something about community that's totally contrary to the spirit of this festival and to the spirit of this community. So I think those are two, that the procedural one versus the, the narrative one are often two good ones. You can pick whichever ones you want, but they're good because they're quite different in their approach and in their outcome. Because the process one, your outcome will be really hinging on specific words and specific actions. And it could be quite a different response to the one that's looking at, well, what does this mean in terms of our sense of ourselves and the story we're telling? Anyway, hopefully that will have given you some um, guidance to think about, some ideas. I mean, and as always, message me. If you've got questions and want to follow up, the last part of the um, part B, I don't, I don't really need to talk about a lot more than, than already in the um, um, the paper there. It's just thinking about teamwork and working with others and developing a sense of community as you study. If you're learning online, it is it is hard, but also really important to start making those links with others, start developing those relationships with other students that are going to benefit you throughout your studies and throughout your professional life. Um, university is not just a matter of, you know, trying to get through and, you know, pass and then just, just get the certificate and get gone. Uh, there are all sorts of opportunities that will benefit you throughout your life. Um, so don't, ignore and I know a lot of I mean I'm an introvert too I'm very bad at networking I'm very bad at, at at reaching out to people but take advantage of those opportunities where you can because these are, are some of the more substantial benefits from doing a degree the things you learn in the degree most of which are going to be redundant by the time you're working in for a few years the world's going to have changed um, you know, the knowledge that you've got is all going to be different, but the connections that you make are going to be really important later on. So developing those good teamwork skills, being a good team player and everything else is not just about ticking the box in terms of teamwork as a, as a graduate outcome. It's also about the benefit it has for you going forward in being able to be, you know, you don't have to be loud, you don't have to be dominant, you don't have to be gregarious and be the butterfly of the ball and have everyone, you know, a thousand friends. But making those good, solid, strong connections is something that will benefit you throughout your throughout your life.